Okay, well, Dave, I think we can uh, get started here. Uh, got a bunch of folks already joined and um, can get this rolling. So um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight for the uh, first of five heat pump webinars that we are hosting this summer. Um, the schedule you can see there for the rest of our webinars um, throughout the rest of the summer. Um, you can register to any or all of them um, and or watch them at a later time if you can't make the live webinar. Um, just to have a few housekeeping items to address before we get started here. We are recording this webinar, just so everyone is aware. Um, and the recording will be available on our YouTube page within a few days after the webinar is completed. Um, so we will follow up after this webinar with an email with lots of information, um, all of the slides that you see today, as well as a link to that recording. Um, we will have time for questions and answers Q&A after the presentation by Dave. So if you folks see that Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen, screen please type your all of your questions in there um, and they'll be answered at the end. Um, we also have the chat available if anybody would like to use it. Um, if you have any issues um, viewing anything or any issues at all with the webinar, please send us a chat um, to let us know. But otherwise, all questions should be submitted to that Q&A box. So um, like I said, this is the first of five heat pump webinars that we'll be hosting this summer. Um, this one's specifically about heat pump water heaters for new and existing homes. You can see the next one's for mini split heat pumps. Um, we've got uh, air to water heat pumps and then ducted heat pump systems, as well as heat pump systems for uh, new builds. Um, Dave, if you could go to the next slide. I uh, just want to give a big thank you to all the sponsors for this webinar series. Um, this series wouldn't be possible without you all helping support us. So thanks a ton for all of your support. Dave, next slide. Um, this is uh, kind of a layout of all the areas where you might be able to get rebates through Energy Smart Colorado. Um, Energy Smart Colorado operates throughout rural Colorado. Um, and so all of these locations, you might be able to access their services for home energy assessments and rebates and just any information about energy efficiency in your homes or businesses. Okay, and uh, finally, we've got our presenter, Dave Pichurai. Um Dave has uh, helped us a lot over the years with this series as well as some other projects. Um, Dave has a master's in geophysics from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he was a lead for technical sales at RMS Electric. He's a founder and president of Blue Valley Energy. Um, was a sustainability manager for Golden Aluminum, a consultant for XL Energy, and now his latest project or business is, uh, he's the owner of NTS Energy, um, which is a home energy solutions consulting for HVAC, solar, electric vehicles, um, kind of anything having to do with energy usage in your home. 
and um, today he'll be talking all about heat pump water heaters. So Dave, take it away. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Diego. Um, so today we're going to talk about heat pump water heaters, which you'll see um, on websites, et cetera, also called hybrid water heaters. So it's, those two ter terms are interchangeable. Um, a few topics. I got about uh, 15 slides, about 20 minutes worth of material. And so we'll have plenty of time to talk, have questions and answers, talk about some of your specific needs at the end. Um, just the one slide about quickly how they work, um, energy benefits, a lot of talking about, you know, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding or just over, overwhelming information. Do they work, fit in your home? Will they work? Um, about how much they cost. Um, and then pollution GHG benefits and then summarize. And then Diego's going to get into a bit more about some of the specifics of how much rebates and incentives are out there. There are quite a few. So how does a heat pump water heater work? Basically, you can think of it as, and, and this talk is geared towards uh, mostly homeowners or people who are very interested in, in you know, this technology and where it's really at and how difficult it is or easy it is to, to adapt it to homes. So think of an electric water heater and then stuck on top, you've got basically a heat pump. And I'm not going to go into the heat pump cycle, but what the way I think I like to think about this in it is, is air gets sucked into the heat pump part of the water heater. And it's basically, uh, think of it as sipping heat from the air in the room. So you basically are going to be drawing air in there, pulling some of the heat out, concentrating in the water, blowing a bit of cool air out and heating up your water tank. You're taking a lot of heat from a big volume of air and putting it in, in water over time. And People ask, does the room temperature drop? Yeah, it can drop. It's not going to suddenly become a freezer for you. Um, I guess if you worked it hard enough, it could be a wine cellar. Um, but generally, a few degrees here and there. And it has standard heating, electric heating elements in, in the bottom of these. And that's why the manufacturers like to call it hybrid. So why do these? why is this sort of a big leap in domestic hot water and energy benefits? Um, so uniform energy factor is, is how everything's rated in, in the water heating world, and that's what you'll see labeled on your tanks. Um, and it's a measure of overall efficiency. And the higher that number is, the better. And then this little chart here on the left side is zero up to five. Basically, the way you can think about it is that number says, if I put a unit of energy in, how much energy do I get into heating my water? And you can start from the less, and this is sort of just standard vented gas tank, it's like 60%. And then power vent gas is 85, 90. And then you've got you know, electric tank, which is 90, and you've got tankless. So everything, nothing's, you know, everything's sort of for the 60 to 90, which is basically 0. 0.6 to about 0. 0.9. And then all of a sudden you have this giant bar up here is, is the hybrid electric tank and <clears throat> hybrid water heat or heat pump. And that's like three and a half because you're only putting a little electricity in to basically as a heat pump to sip heat from, from the air in, in the room. And a lot of people, one of the, I think one of the best questions that gets asked is, well, you know, I'm putting energy into my house to heat it. Am I really doing much benefit? You are because think of it as this is just a little section of the house and maybe over time you're, you know, in, in a lot of months you're, you're, pulling it out and it's a few degrees less, but it's nothing really noticeable. So your electric bill for your, if you had a, and I'll have examples, you know, electric water heater versus a heat pump is gonna be a lot less. So let's talk about fitting these into homes. And um, there's a lot there about, they take up more room, what space. There's two parts to this. One is, will it actually fit into the space I have designated? my current tenant. Now, if you have a big, huge mechanical room or basement, this is not an issue, but you know, let's, let's talk about it a little bit. So basically the heat pump water heater is about the same width and around 14 inches taller than electric tank water heater of the same capacity. Um, for natural gas, it's about a little bit wider and a little bit taller than natural gas water heater, but that's not including the vent part. So overall, roughly similar. The other thing you always have to think about is clearance for accessibility for maintenance 
Um, and the front clearance on all these is two to three feet. You need room to deal with it. A back clearance is basically right against the wall or within six inches of the wall. And then side clearance, depending on how they do it, um, you basically might need a little more room for the side to get to the piping. So and these are some examples, I think, to see the comparison. Here's your straight up electric. Here's a gas vent. And then here's a, here's a heat pump water heater here. So not a lot of difference in fitting them into the space. This is the biggest difference. It's saying I need to make sure that where I put this, there's enough volume of air to adequately draw heat out and really and heat my hot water. And so there's several ways to do this and they will have varying um, difficulty slash cost for your existing home. So first of all, if you, if, if you have a room that has 750 cubic feet of, of room or between 750 and 1,000, you've got plenty of space and you don't really, it's got enough air in there, it's gonna run it, it's gonna suck heat out of the room, a few degrees down, your water's hot, air get, heat comes you know, in from the other parts of the house. Um, so you've got no problem. It's really like putting in an electric hot water heater. But if you don't have a big enough room, there's the first strategy is you know, the, basically you'll see louvered doors. So basically, all right, I've basically got an air pathway to the adjacent room and I can suck in and out. Now you can say, well, I don't, you know, do I want to buy louvered doors? Do I want a louvered door there? Maybe not. But you can actually put, and I just was recently at a house that, you know, you can put louvered or think of them as wall grills various parts of the room between the room that the heat pump water heater in is in and other rooms and they don't have to be in the same walls or anything basically think of you know a couple 12 by 12 maybe a little bit more if you put them in the same wall you wouldn't put them next to each other high low but that's maybe in certain cases a little less expensive than buying a whole louver door or something you might want then there's something called the single duct strategy so these need um, they have at the top, you can adapt and put an eight inch duct um, either to pull air through the heat pump part or push it out. And you can do either one of these and you can have a duct going out to the adjacent room if there's an easy path. And then you can have a louver. So you can think of it as pulling air in from adjacent room for the duct and then it'll push it out into the smaller room, but it'll go out through the levers, louvers or vice versa. So that's another strategy. And finally, the other one is the two duct strategy, where basically you've got room wherever you are, and you can duct to two to outside rooms to get more air for these ducts. Now, you want to keep in mind the location on the other side of this duct, because when it's exhausting out, the air is going to be a little bit cool. So you don't want to put your favorite reading chair there, um, you know, a hallway or something else. So you want to think about that a little bit. Next. So here's a couple, here's various illustrations. These are all heat pumps. This is in a big room. Um, they got lots of space. Probably seems like they had enough space, but they might have, this might have been the south. They might have ducted it outside um, to get more warm air. And I'll talk about that in the next couple slides, why you might want to think about that. Here's a small space. They put it in here. Obviously, they got a full louver door next to it. And this one here, they've got a louver door, so they probably didn't have to do this, but it looks like they're potentially ducting from up high. Maybe, maybe they've got to chase all the way up the second floor to pull warm air. And this one is in a big area, big basement mechanical rooms. And notice, I don't have any ducting or anything at all. I'm just pulling air from the room. So the, it's the core installation differences, electrical, same as electric water heater, you need 30 amps, you need a 220. Plumbing similar, the heat pump, we're all talking about airflow. That's what we spent the last three slides on. Um, obviously, if you're replacing a gas, you no longer need gas supply or venting, which is a benefit. A lot of questions about the sound levels of these. Does this heat pump part make noise? It's a hard question to answer because people have various sensitivity. The way, the way I have to think about it, it's about a refrigerator. Um, if I have it in a basement, I'm not going to, in a, there's a, quiet bedroom next to it. I'm not going to necessarily put it on the wall opposite that or a quiet office or a theater room. So you just want to think about 
that if you have those cases. Otherwise, normal activity rooms, mechanical rooms, you know, you've got good insulation between rooms, um, the noise shouldn't be a problem. So with new construction, you've got a big advantage. Let's, let's think about making it really easy to put these units in. Um, and some options to consider. I mean, do you, do you just put a louver? If you've got a small space, if you're in condos, apartments, um, you're going to be on the main living area. You, you know, you want to do the louver doors. You could do the wall grills, or you could think about in that room, how do I get one duct for maybe intake and then use the louvers for the other? Um, and if you want to do ducting, you can actually plan them to a bigger adjacent room. So you can think about maybe, mm, maybe if I have a, a half buried basement and I've got a south facing room, it's going to be a little bit warmer. Maybe you have a way to pull air from there. And exhausting hallways are really great places to exhaust. If you want to get the most benefit out of this, um, the most an energy benefit and the lowest cost, and you're planning a new home, you can get a little more sophisticated. You can basically um, have dampers and ducts go to the outside of the house. Um, you have ducts go to the outside, and in that pathway, you have dampers. Um, seasonal dampers, and you can have inside intakes to other rooms or within that room. The plan there is for the six months of the year that the unit, the outside air temperature is above 40 degrees, typically, you switch those dampers and you use that free heat in the outside air, basically late spring through early fall. And then you flip it once a year, and then you do it inside. Now, one thing about it is, can these work in recirculation? If I've got, you know, DHW recirc throughout a big house, mm, generally they'll say no, not a great idea because they need a, a temperature drop and they don't want to cycle a heat pump a lot. Little to read, there are some third parties that have some controls and strategies to do that. Um, if you want to learn more details about that, drop me an email and I'll send you some links. Um, to strategies that, that might work for that. So the other question that comes out is, you know, heat pump or hybrid water heaters, do they produce as much hot water as um, my gas hot water heater, my electric? And about 20 years ago, there was sort of one round of these and they were heat pumps only. And they were in, in a lot of situations where maybe there wasn't enough ambient room or the demand was bigger than the the water heater was surprised and or sized and people thought, oh, these, you know, there was some word that got around that they don't produce enough hot water. Well, that's really not true with the hybrid heat pump ones. So if you're replacing an electric tank water heater and you've been satisfied with how much domestic hot water, you can put the same size heat pump water heater and you'll get as much or maybe even a little capacity. If you're replacing a gas tank water heater and you want to have about the same first hour capacity, you need to upsize the hybrid water heater to have very similar capacity. So in other words, if you got a 40 gallon gas, you put up 50 gallon hybrid. You got somewhere around 50, 55 gallon gas, you upsize to 65. You got 60, 65 gas, you upsize to an 80. And all these, these are kind of the three standard residential sizes available. As I've said before, um, same uh, electrical requirements as a standard water heater. The other question that comes up a lot is what are the modes of operation? Um, the most energy efficient, or the, a lot of, they call it some of the manufacturers, energy saver mode, highest efficiency, lowest cost operation. It basically just uses the heat pump. It says, don't use the electrical at all, unless for some reason you've put it in a space that's really small, this would almost be not the best installation strategy unless you put it in a totally unconditioned base, basement that wasn't really well sealed in the winter. Um, if for some reason that air gets below 40, it will, to protect itself, it will flip into electric mode. Um, and then there's a hybrid mode, which basically uses the heat pump mostly, um, but it can go to the supplement with electric elements, depending on how much demand there is. And how, you know, whether the, the water is drained down, you need, you need higher, um, you want to try to get that 
uh, first hour back up again. And some some um, heat pumps have a couple of hybrids. And then there's pretty typical vacation mode, set it back, don't waste that. And then there's electric mode, which I guess I would also call this, you know, um, <clears throat> mode for repair mode. If something happened to the heat pump part, you just put an electric piece to that hot part. So what are some of the cost issues here? Or what's the cost? And this, these numbers are, the way this is laid out, so this is a natural gas 40 gallon, um, and this would be electric 50 and hybrid 50, which would replace this. Um, these are, you know, for pricings right off of Home Depot, try to get similar warranty, similar level of quality. So I'm not comparing you know, a cheap one with a real expensive one. And so this is 40, 50, 50, and this is 50. Electric's funny, doesn't go to 65, a little bit bigger one. Try to be comparable here. Electric's probably a little short on this one. So this is the this is the product cost right off the site, um, and that's you know pretty typical of these kind of cost differences. Now, if you have someone install them, they might mark them up a bit more. Um, and this, so what's the difference in inst installation? I mean, you got to do this piping, et cetera. Well, if you are replacing a gas and you don't have a 220 line. They've got to hire electrician. Electricians these days um, don't come cheap. Somewhere around anywhere from seven fifty to fifteen hundred to run that line. Um, and now you've got to get air. If you're in a small space, you've got to either get wall grates or louver doors. Some strategy there, five hundred. Um, and so, um, so that's these are some of the extra costs. Now, what's the heat pump water here? Extra cross versus an electric. So I want to replace my 50 gallon electric with a hybrid. I don't have this cost because I already get power. So I have this cost plus the difference in price. About third, think of it 13 to 1500 dollars price difference to replace my electric with a heat pump. What is it to replace my gas with a heat pump? Well, the big deal is I've got to put in a run a run a 220 line usually. Um, and so it's more 2500 But as Diego will show. There's quite a lot of rebates going on. And so we've got two to three thousand dollars. And I just threw like a generalized number in there, but basically the rebates can cover these cost differences. Um, and then also now you've got 50 gallon to 65 gallon. Not really, it doesn't really affect these numbers a lot. I mean, both of them raise up in prices. So you've still got like 1300, 2500. So I think you can think about it as the the installation cost is really not going to be much different with these rebates. There might be cases a little bit more, but um, not a huge amount. So then the question is, how much is my annual heating cost? And I uh, run, a, run a standard program uh, that, that has and put a family of four, 65 gallons a day, of hot water. I use, this is the prices 2023 average annual price for Colorado of electric, 14.3 cents a kilowatt hour. And, um, and therms, this is for 2023. And propane is kind of an estimate with the markup on that. So this is the annual cost. And I think you look at the right column here is important. Against electric, um, it's really, it's going to save a ton because it's basically um, you know, that much more efficient straight up, even against propane, because propane, you know, is relatively expensive to gas. I'd say versus the kind of gas you have, um, maybe it'll save a little bit more um, or it's on par. So, you know, think about it. You're putting in one or the other. Um, you're not changing, at least with 2023 prices, not changing your annual cost a lot. Prices go up and down, but... Uh, with the heat pump water, the one advantage is overall you're using less energy. So the other question is, well, you know, a lot of people are wanting to be more energy efficient. Is it gonna, you know, is it benefiting the bigger picture, my local environment, um, the global picture? So think of it, a hot water heater you purchase in 24, on the average gonna last 12 years, so 2036. So we need to think of that. What this pretty rainbow chart shows on this left side, the negative number says, so this is the energy, the GHG savings of a heat pump water relative to these other types of water heat. 
Above here is how much the heat pump GHG saves. Below, the heat pump uses more GHG. So we don't have quite the most up-to-date data um, published yet. 2022, Holy Cross and Excel, it takes a while for them to put out their data. Th these numbers are based on what's called grid intensity. And so what it says is for each kilowatt hours, how many pounds or kilograms of GHGs do I emit? So it's basically it's a measure of how how clean your grid is. Um, in 2022, and I'm not you know you could do it for every utility in Colorado. These are just a couple. Of, uh, this is Holy Cross, the local one up here, and Excel. And you can see for electric, it's a no-brainer. But for gas, 2022. Now the 2023 numbers are going to come out soon, but we do have um, projections for 2025 numbers, and so. Um, if you look at 2025 at Holy Cross, they're very ambitious, have a great plan to basically uh, reduce, uh, clean their grid, lower the intensity dramatically. And in any case, against all these different ones, this is a gas, is orange is gas, orange is power event, blue is tankless. Notice that. Notice Excel um, close, a little bit better here in the gas. These are a little bit low, but by 2025. And then the projections 2030, um, heat pumps, water heaters, lower the GHG. So how do we summarize this? Well, for the first two years, um, heat pump water heaters and most of the most of Colorado grids is going to produce somewhat more. But then years three to five, think about it, you know, 2026 to 2028, um, the heat pump water less or or about the same. So basically in those three years in general. All of a sudden, we've hit that breakover point. And then the last half of it, the heat pump water is going to produce less. So overall, you're making a purchase for 12 years. We're getting better about everything with regards to the grid and all technologies. So, so your, your use is helping that. So what's the summary here? Um, <clears throat> it's, this, is a, this is a mature technology. This is not something right out new. Um, they're very efficient. Um, you've got large annual savings versus electric propane with current prices. They're on par slightly lower than NG. Um, they can be installed in, in homes, um, depending on the situation, you know, it'd be a little more, but the rebates are gonna cover a lot of stuff and you're gonna have quite a bit of GHG reduction. So I'll turn it back over to Diego to talk about um, rebates. Great, yeah, and thanks. Thanks so much, Dave. Uh, some great information in there. Um, yeah, we just wanted to point out one more time um, through uh, Energy Smart Colorado, um, heat pump water heater rebates uh, are likely available in your area um, for existing buildings, existing homes and businesses. Um, and uh, one great way to get started is to get a home energy assessment through Energy Smart Colorado to figure out what situation might be best for you and how much you might be able to save from a heat pump water heater installation. Next slide, please. Sure. Um, and then this is a quick snapshot of rebates available for heat pump water heaters in various areas. Um, so through High Country Conservation Center over in Summit County, um, folks who make up to 160% of the area median income can get up to $4,000 uh, in rebates for a heat pump or heat pump water heater. Um, any households making over that amount can get up to $1,000 for a heat pump water heater rebate. Um, you can certainly reach out to them if you're over in Summit County and want to learn more about their rebate programs. We've got some contact information there. Sorry, I don't have an email address on there. Um, I'll be sure to fix that when we send out the slides in our follow-up. Um, CORE is uh, operating down in the Roaring Fork Valley, so uh, Pitkin County and City of Aspen. Um, folks can get 50% of their uh, costs back up to $7,500 if you are making over 150% area median income or if you're making less than 150% area median income or you qualify as a community priority participant, you can get up to $15,000 in rebates from CORE. 
Um, and this is for existing buildings. Again, I believe CORE does have a different grant program for new construction. Um, CLEAR uh, in um, Carbondale and Glenwood Springs, um, depending on your utility, can get pretty significant rebates for heat pump water heaters. Um, details are right there. Uh, we have been told that rebate funds from Glenwood Springs Electric have been exhausted for 2024 um, and may not be available again until next year. Um, but again, there's contact info there if you'd like to reach out to them. Uh, if you are in uh, Garfield County, uh, CLEAR would be your closest resource. Um, and then here in the Eagle River Valley, um, for all of Eagle County, except for the portions of Eagle County in the Rowan Port Valley, um, through Walking Mountains, um, you can get up to 25% of your project costs back, up to $1,000 for a heat pump or a heat pump water heater. Um, if folks make less than or up to 150% of the area median income for Eagle County, uh, they're encouraged to apply for our new Re-Energize Eagle County program, um, which is a little bit different from our standard rebate program. Um, again, please reach out to us if you have any questions about our rebates or any of our programs, and you can also find rebate details online at that link provided. If you are a Holy Cross Energy member, um, there are significant rebates available through them as well. So these are on top of rebates that you might get from Energy Smart Colorado. Um, so Holy Cross has a new income qualified residential rebate for households making less than 150% of the area median income in our area, sorry, in Walking Mountains territory. Um, they offer up to $7,500 and 50% of the cost covered for heat pump water heater project. Um, their standard rebates are 25% of the project cost up to $3,000. Um, and then we also have commercial multifamily rebates through Holy Cross up to 25% up to $7,500 um, per project. And multifamily projects, um, to qualify must include four or more units within that building. And then uh, Tri-State also has rebate programs available through their um, cooperative members. Um, lots of information can be found on those links. Um, so you can certainly check that out when we follow up with these slides. And then uh, another great resource we like to give to folks is a website called loveelectric.org. Um, lots of great information about their, on there about all sorts of heat pump technology and electrification um, projects. It's really a one-stop shop for information um, about electrification throughout Colorado. Um, they outline benefits of switching over from gas or propane or electric resistance um, heat sources over to efficient electric equipment. And um, they can offer, also provide explanations and cost estimates for kind of the best heat pump applications. And they also host a list of qualified installers of heat pumps and heat pump water heaters on their website. Uh, so great resource there as well. And uh, just one last thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, hope you learned something valuable and um, thank you again to all the sponsors who are helping us put this on as well. Uh, could not do it without you. So um, that concludes the presentation portion of the webinar today. Um, but it looks like we have a couple of questions um, to answer here. So first question. Hey, well, one from... thing about rebates, you should mention there's, we forgot to mention there's a 2000 federal 
dollar federal tax credit right. on top of that too. So if you add all these up, um, the heat pump water heater cost is going to be easily on par with conventional or often less. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Dave. Yeah, that federal tax credit is really significant and uh, can reduce a lot of that um, cost over time for you. So um, question from Lou, um, what about switching out an on-demand gas water heater? What might that look like? I think, Lou, I think the only, um, the the trouble might be often you put in an on-demand gas water heater because you don't have very much space. So, you know, if you can find closet space, well, I mean, it's really, is there space to put a tank in somewhere in your house, um, either where the, either where the on-demand is or maybe down, you know, back in your mechanical room where the original hot water was, and you got to find space to put it in. Um, I did have it on there. The heat pump water heaters um, still are you know, more energy efficient and they're on cost par with that. So um, <clears throat> it's really space and then, um, you know, getting enough air space. So you're going to put in this tiny spot. You're going to probably want a louver door or something like that. So if you got space, um, there's still, depending on how you measure it in terms of GHGs, in terms of, you know, Annual cost is on par. Upfront cost um, would be would be would be lower or close. So um, that's kind of it. I'm not sure if outside, you know, there, you, that you can put some of these outside. You, you're not going to be able to put a heat pump water heater outside. Um, so that's if you have any other angle or any other question, you know, put it in the chat or uh, email one of us, and we can talk about it more. Thanks, Dave. Um, great question from Jess here. Um, Jess says, I don't have a standalone water heater. I have a sidearm tank. Um, how would a heat pump water heater apply in their home? Well, you can certainly remove your sidearm and put a heat pump water heater. And then the question, you know, where on the spectrum of efficiency does a sidearm fall? And it's pretty high relative to the other gas. I mean, you're still, um, using gas to heat, so it'd still be, you know, it'd be quite close to one, um, but it's it's not going to be as energy efficient as a heat pump water heater. So I think if you look at the chart there, the charts, I've, if you compare it to sort of almost the on-demand gas water heater in terms of efficiency, that's where it's going to be close. Um, you can just, you know, you could take out your on your on-demand, your sidearm, Put your heat pump water heater and all the rules in terms of the space in the mechanical room, et cetera, et cetera, will apply. Um, I think one thing you do need to think about is um, if you put it in a mechanical room with a boiler and a lot of radiant zoning, and that mechanical room is really hot, um, you can say, well, gosh, I can put a heat pump water heater in and um, take advantage of that heat. <laughs> for free, but but really the approach should be what you want to do is insulate all the lines in the mechanical room. That's really what you're doing is you're losing heat in the mechanical room that you want delivered to the zones. So you really want to insulate that piping first. You're still going to have some heat leakage, which you can't help. Then you can use the heat pump water heater to take advantage of that little extra heat leakage. But don't just have poorly insulated radiant pipes, put the heat pump water heater in there because in a way you're pulling more heat out of the room and all of a sudden you have less, less, um, you have basically less efficiency going to this. So hopefully that helps understand that a little more. All right, Dave, we got one more question from the chat here. Um, I'm a new home builder without much experience with heat pumps. If you're installing both a heat pump home heating system and a heat pump water heater, can the same heat pump be used for both? Or do these hybrid water heaters only have the option for built-in heat pumps? Um, yeah, only, so they're really one, one, one. The hybrid heat pump water heaters have the heat pump on top. It's integrated as part of the product. 
Um, there are products not available in the U.S. and Europe. If you have Radiant, they, they have products which will be here in five years or so. We're out of one box. You can kind of get Radiant and get your domestic hot water heat. But um, it's a very sophisticated, integrated package, but it's not available right now. So for the moment, um, you just keep them separate. Okay. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, any other questions out there? Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you don't want to type it in the chat. Uh, I can unmute you. Um, give, give us another minute or so here to see if we have any final questions. I guess if anyone wants a comment, was this helpful in terms of clarifying um, what what you need to think about to put put heat pump water heaters in, what the benefits are, what what it's going to take to to change over? Hopefully, uh, it answered most of most of your questions or the reason for spending the time with us this evening. So, if anyone has any thoughts on that, put them in the chat or. Um, I think Diego, we will send out a survey, right? Yep. Yeah, we will uh, include a survey in our follow up. So feel free to fill that out if you found this useful or if you didn't, we'd love to know as well. Um, but yeah, thanks again, Dave. Thanks again to all of our sponsors and thanks for everybody who joined us today. Sorry, it looks like we got one more question here at the last second. Um, sure. Would you replace electric baseboard or electric hot water first? Um, well, to give you an idea, so your, your heating uses well over 50% of the energy use in your house. Um, domestic hot water uses around 30%. So if you want to make the biggest impact first, you replace the electric baseboard. The difference is replacing the electric baseboard versus electric hot water heater in terms of costs is an order of magnitude difference. You know, um, <clears throat> you're going to be able to get an electric water. You're going to be able to uh, get a heat pump water heater in after the rebates. And everything you know, it's going to be um, less than, geez, a couple thousand bucks you know, after all these rebates. You're going to go out and replace the electric baseboard with mini split heat pump systems in, which is one of the um, one of the webinars coming up this summer. Um, it's great. It will do that. I'll give you cooling, but you know, you're looking at um, geez, the minimum 20, you know, 20, tens of thousands of dollars, um, depending on how big your house on these systems and everything. So, so um, that's that's kind of the difference there. Yeah, and, and I guess to elaborate a little more on that, it, it kind of really depends on your specific situation and what you're looking to get out of uh, a replacement. Um, if you're looking purely for energy savings and increased comfort, then replacing an electric baseboard with a heat pump system uh, would yield great benefits there. Um, or if you use a unusually high amount of hot water and you're paying a lot just for hot water heating, um, then the uh, heat pump water heater would probably be the first thing you'd want to address. Um, but I think the best place to start is to get a home energy assessment so you can understand a little bit more about how all that energy is being used and what might be of most benefit to you. So Yeah, Doug, feel free to, to email myself or Diego, he'll forward it, and, you know, about your specific situation and, you know, we could discuss that a little more. Yeah. Yeah. And as always, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we'll have some contact information in the slides that we're going to follow up with. Um, but yeah, we're always happy to answer any further questions. So if anybody's got any more questions, uh, once this is over, um, we're happy to, to talk a little bit more over email or over the phone. Just let us know how we can help. Okay. Well, thanks again for everybody. And thank you, Dave. Um, 
Thanks, Diego. Thank you, everyone, done. for taking the time out. Have a good evening, everyone. All right. Take care, everybody.